Welcome, welcome to Chapel of Change Dallas and our Saturday Encouraging Word. We welcome you and we love you, but even more so, Jesus loves you. At this time, we invite you, press that share button. Share this with your friends, with your family. Let's saturate Dallas with the Word of God. We invite you also at this time, put your prayer requests in the comments so we can pray with you towards the end. Right now, I want to shift. I want to shift and I want to speak to you on the topic of we are people who display diversity. We are people who display diversity. Now, when you look at Chapel of Change Dallas, you can already see diversity taking place. We live diversity out from the pulpit to the pews. We celebrate diversity here at Chapel of Change Dallas. Did you know? Did you know that we are one of the few churches in America that are diverse and we celebrate it? Today, check this out. Check this out real quick. Today, 86% of churches in America are still divided by race. 86% of churches are still either brown churches, white churches, black churches, or yellow churches. We're still divided. My personal experience with racism and segregation has been unique. You see, personally, I grew up in an all-white church. I even went to a racially divided high school. I've seen racism and segregation hands on. So what have we done with the kingdom of God? What have we done? You know, when we lived back in LA, I walked into an Apple store and that store was more diverse than the church. Something's wrong here. Why is it that an Apple store and a nightclub can be more diverse than a church? Diversity is everywhere, but in churches. God has risen Chapel of Change to demonstrate that God will bring different people together. Today, today we're going to look at one of the first events in the Bible that highlights racial reconciliation. We're going to learn the mind of God on the issue and our responsibility as Christians. Now, we see in Acts 11, we find Apostle Peter giving a report before church leaders on what God did in Acts 10. In Acts 10, we see God bringing two opposing groups together, the Jews and the Gentiles. Now the Jews and the Gentiles, they hated each other. The Jews hated the Gentiles so much that in the Jewish temple there was a plaque that read, any Gentile who enters here is responsible for his own death. That's how much the Jews hated the Gentiles. In Acts 10, God brings together the Jews and the Gentiles. In Acts 10, God reveals, God reveals the gospel doesn't just reconcile us back to God, but it reconciles us back to each other, each other. And God reveals this in a radical way. Check it out. He uses a Gentile by the name of Cornelius and a Jew by the name of Peter to get this done. Let's hear uh, Peter's report before the leaders of the church in Acts 11 verses 1 through 8 and it says now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God and when Peter came up to Jerusalem those of the circumcision contended with him saying you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them but Peter explained it to them in order, in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. An object descended like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. 
When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them. Doubt nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Now, God, God is for radical reconciliation, and reconciliation is peace after war. It's bringing back people together. Historically, historically, the Jews and the Gentiles hated one another. Let's remember that plaque. They hated one another. The Jews wouldn't talk to the Gentiles or have anything to do with them. It was considered idolatry to eat with the Gentiles. When we study this miracle of reconciliation between two people, between the Jews and the Gentiles, we see God is the initiator of it. God, God is the one moving and bringing two different groups of people together. Check it out, check it out. God sends an angel to speak to Cornelius, who is a Gentile, about Peter, who is a Jew. God gives the apostle Peter a vision for his plan for reconciliation. God through the Holy Spirit, leads Apostle Peter to Cornelius' house. Without God's intervention, this miracle of reconciliation wouldn't happen. God is for recon reconciliation of all groups of people who are at odds with one another. Let me say that again, because I think that's a really important, important point. God is for reconciliation of groups of all people who are at odds with one another. There is a subplot at work in the story of our redemption. God is bringing together the divergent technic ethnicities and cultures that sin had separated. The salvation that God promises is not just an individual recon reconciliation with God, though that is primary. It is also an interracial reconciliation with one another. Get this, get this. One of the purposes of salvation is to bring the races back together. It's to bring whites back with blacks. To bring Polynesian back with Hispanics. Sin divided us. Jesus unites us. Jesus unites us. Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 15 say, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles 
into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us he made peace between jews and gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups on the night before jesus died he prayed specifically for all of us in john 12. And do you know what he prayed for? Not to prosper, not to be blessed, but to be one, to be one. Three times in three verses, he prayed that we would be one. John 17, 23 says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. He desired that his church be one, not a brown church, not a white church, not a black church, but one church. But why? Why? Our oneness proves that Jesus was sent from the Father. Division in the church is an attack on Jesus himself. Division is an attack on the gospel. If the enemy can divide us, then he dilutes the message of the gospel. If the enemy divide, die, divides us, he guts the power from the gospel. God wants us to embrace diversity, not just tolerate it. God's intention with Apostle Peter was not just to change his mind about racism, but to change his lifestyle. He didn't want Peter to, he didn't want Peter to just tolerate Cornelius from a distance. He wanted him to embrace Cornelius. Get this, get this. God sent Apostle Peter into Cornelius' living room. God sent Peter to eat with Cornelius. God sent Peter to fellowship with Cornelius. Get this, get this right here. If you're a Christian, it's not enough to just say, I'm not a racist. If you're a Christian, it's not enough to just say, I don't hate anyone. The goal of the gospel is not just to deliver you from racism, but to radically change your life. The goal of the gospel is to radically change you so that you embrace people that are different than you. Jesus didn't come to make you just a little better. He came to radically change your life. Let me say that again. Jesus didn't come just to make you a little better. He came, Jesus came to radically change your life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not just a better person, not just a rebuilt person, but a new creation. So this is someone who has never existed before. That's radical. God wants you to live a multi-ethnic life. That's radical. God wants you to love those who hate you. That's radical. Forgive those who hurt you. That's radical. God wants us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Let me say that again real quick. God wants us to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Why? This whole situation was highly uncomfortable for Peter. It went against the grain of what he was taught. Peter was used to hanging around people that looked like him, people that acted like him, and people that ate like him. Peter's hatred for, gen for Gentiles was so deep that at first he resisted God. Imagine that. God begins preparing Peter for this big move, and Peter says, no, nope, that's 
not going to happen. I'm not doing it. No. God was moving Peter out of his comfort zone. How do you know? How do you know when God is moving in your life? Let me tell you. When you start feeling led to do things that are uncomfortable, God is moving in your life. When you start feeling led to sacrifice your, prefer your preferences for God's priorities, God is moving in your life. God did not call his people to be comfortable in life. We're not going to change the world living comfortable lives. Let me tell you something. Now get this. Get this. The greatest threat to the kingdom of God is not unbelievers. The greatest threat to the kingdom of God is not persecution. Let me suggest this to you right now. The greatest threat to the kingdom of God is comfortable Christians. Comfortable Christians. Christians who are addicted to being comfortable, addicted to the convenience of the world. Why? Because they won't risk anything for God. They won't sacrifice anything for God. I say right now, I say right now, away with comfortable Christians. I say away with Christians addicted to the convenience of the world. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of peace, of love, and a sound mind. A sound mind. God wants some radical Christians. People to impact the world with the gospel. He wants, to, he wants to be used in a special way. See, Chapel of Change, we're not called to be a normal church. We're not called to be your normal everyday church. My prayer is that you embrace the change. You embrace being uncomfortable. You embrace being outside of your zone. Embrace the gospel. Embrace his call. And when you feel that tension, know that's God calling you out of your comfort zone. Know it's God calling you to a new season. Know it's God calling you to do something that you don't want to do. Trust me, I've been there. I didn't want to do a lot of things, but God said, come on, let's go. It's time to move. Move and watch me work. Now, let God work in your life. Allow him to work through you and in you and for you. Because as the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Come on, somebody. Who can be against you? At this time, I'd like to say a little prayer. Father God, Right now we come before you and we thank you for this word, Father God. We thank you for the uncomfortableness. We thank you for the moves that you make. We thank you, Father, for bringing us into new season and into, into new territory, Father God. Right now, we are asking, Father, continue. Continue to take us into those uncomfortable situations. Continue to take us into those things we don't want to do. And Father, when we are like Peter, when we're pushing back, when we're saying no, Father God, Continue to press to us and let us know, yes, this is where I'm leading you. Yes, this is where I want you to go. Yes, you need to go here to work in, in my name. Father God, I pray, I pray that every day we bring you glory. We bring glory to your name eternally, Father God. I thank you, Father God. I praise you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And right now, I feel there might be a couple of you out there who are feeling that tug, that tug to come back. He's calling you right now. Come back to me, son. Come back to me, daughter. If you have drifted away and you're feeling that call to come back, raise your arms with me right now. If you don't know him yet, you want to, and you want to surrender everything to him for him to work in you and through you, Raise your hands and say this prayer with me right now. Repeat after me and say, Father God, I have sinned. I turn from you. I am sorry. Right now I turn back.
back to you. And I welcome you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Saints, we believe right now here at Chapel of Change. If you said that prayer with me and you believed every single word in your heart, you are a new creation in Christ. And now that you are a new creation in Christ, let that radical change happen in your life. And because you are a new creation in Christ, because you did surrender, the Bible tells us for every sinner that repents, there is a celebration going on in heaven. There is a celebration for you, for coming home. We welcome you home. And we ask that if you did say this prayer with me, put your name in the comments or direct message us as well. We want to connect with you. We want to do life with you. We want to get to know you and help you on this path. I thank you all. I ask, I invite you all, come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. for our Sunday worship service. On um, Monday at 6 p.m. for our Monday night spiritual warfare. And on Wednesday at 7.15 for our midweek Bible study. And we'll see you back here next Saturday at 12 p.m. We love you and God bless you, saints.